So, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how social structure can affect the emergence of linguistic structure and show you some experimental evidence. Uh, because of time, I had to cut it a bit short, so uh, I'm going to focus on a few things, uh, walk you through it. And this is um, joint work with Antje Meyer and Shiri Lavari. So, for me, one of the most interesting questions in the study of language evolution is why do we have so many different languages? So what could be the possible sources for such linguistic diversity? And um, one thing that may cause languages to differ is the fact that they're spoken in different social environments. So the idea is that languages evolve in different communities with different population sizes, different social structures, and different social needs. And the idea is that languages can actually adapt to fit these different social needs. And this fact is often ignored uh, when we study languages, but I think it's really crucial in understanding why languages look the way they look. Um, because the social environment can actually explain some of the patterns of linguistic diversity that we see around the world. So, for example, there's been a few cross-linguistic studies that looked at thousands of languages around the world, and they find this interesting difference between languages that are spoken by big communities and languages that are spoken by small communities. And generally, what these uh, studies show is that languages that are spoken by larger populations seem to have simpler morphological structures. And I'm not going to go into what simple means because it's very well debated, uh, but I would say that generally the idea is that um, somehow these languages are more regular or more systematic, they're either more predictable or transparent or easier to learn, but it's something about regularity um, uh, that makes this uh, simplicity. Um, so the idea is that languages that are spoken by small populations often tend to have very complex and elaborate inflectional morphologies, while languages that are spoken in big populations often have relatively easy morphology or not at all, not at all and when they do, it's quite systematic. So yes, yeah, so it seems to be this inverse relationship between how many people speak the language um, and its morphological complexity. But the problem is that we actually don't know whether it is the size of the community that drives this effect or something else, because community size in the real world is actually just one characteristic of a given society. And it's confounded in the real world with many other social factors that tend to come together with population size. So just to give you a few of the examples, what often tends to correlate with being a small or large population is, for example, the network structure. So small populations tend to be highly connected, tightly knit, where you get to meet everyone in your community and interact with them on a regular basis. While in a large community, it's often the case that the network is much sparser. You don't get to meet everyone in your community. Um, another interesting, uh, important thing is that languages that are spoken by small populations, which are very um, tightly knit, also tend to be more isolated. This is a tendency, it's not always the case, but it's often so that they don't have a lot of contact with outsiders, and if that's true, then there's also uh, children who are the main language learners. Um, and in contrast, if you're a large population spoken um, in a sparse and wide area, it's also the case that you typically have more contact with outsiders. This also means that there is more proportion, higher proportion of adults learning the language as a second language. And the idea, actually, this has been suggested to be the underlying mechanism uh, behind this linguistic sim simplification. Uh, but any of these can be alternative explanations to this correlation between population size. They can be only one of them is relevant, all of them are relevant, uh, but we actually don't know. So the goal of basically my PhD project was to try and experimentally tease these things apart. So look at each of the social factors separately and try to experimentally test what is the unique contribution of each of these features uh, using a laboratory settings. And the way we do this is with a set of experiments and they all use the same paradigm to make it as comparable as possible. So what we do is we actually um, use a group communication game. Uh, we bring participants to the lab and we ask them over the course of several hours to create a new artificial language with each other. They're not allowed to use Dutch or English or any other language they know. Uh, they're only allowed to use nonsense words and gibberish words. And the participant's goal is to successfully interact about different types of novel scenes. I hope you can see them in that middle picture. It's basically four different shapes. And these shapes are moving on the screen in different directions. Um, so they're novel, uh, novel dynamic events. And they also have textures to them. Um, 
And the idea is that our participants, they take turn in describing these scenes to each other and they earn points if they successfully understand each other. So if you say a word and your partner understands you, you get a point. Uh, and they also swap uh, roles between being a, a guesser and a producer, so they get to experience both uh, producing words and understanding them. And we do this so that participants in the same group interact in several rounds in alternating pairs. So at the beginning of each round, they get to play with a different person in the group. They play several games with them, and then they swap and move to a different person. Um, and the idea is that at the beginning of the experiment, participants are really guessing uh, the names and making them up randomly. They have no language to rely on, so they're just kind of making it up. Uh, but over the course of several hours, what we see is that they really start developing linguistic structure and regularities. Basically, they come up with grammars where, for example, they create a specific morpheme to describe one of the shapes and another morpheme to describe the motion, and they add them together to make uh, a very real... I'm going to show you an example of how these languages look like. Um, but the main point is that this is, a, I think, a really cool paradigm because it allows us to look at how languages evolve in real time in a community um, depending on its social structure. So what we do is we manipulate the social features of the group and see what happens. So how does changing the size of the group or the way participants are connected to each other, how is that uh, affecting uh, the type of languages that would evolve? And today I'm only gonna talk about two of these features. I'm gonna talk about the population size manipulation and the network structure manipulation. Okay, and um, so to, first of all, we tested the role of community size. Uh, we did this by comparing small groups of four participants to big groups of eight participants. This is just recently published, so uh, you can go on and read about it if you want. Um, and even though these groups, and I would say they're very small compared to the real world, um, what I hope to show you is that even in this miniature setting, just doubling the number of people in the group already makes a significant difference in how the languages looks like. And in the second experiment, we looked at network structure. Um, that is what happens when the group are, are all of the same size, but what we do is we vary how uh, much participants are connected to each other and how they're connected. So in the first experiment, all the groups were fully connected. Everyone interacted uh, with every person in their group. But in the real world, that's rarely the case. Um, larger populations, as I said, typically have, are much more sparse. They're less connected, and some group members will never meet. Um, and also, not everyone is equally connected. So it's often the case that some individuals interact with a lot of people, and some are more isolated. So what we did is we compared three different types of networks. Uh, the first network was the fully connected network, just like in the first experiment. Um, and uh, here everyone interacts. It does resemble early human societies, but it's much rarer nowadays. Maybe some hunter-gatherer communities or some small villages. Um, and we compared this to a small world network. Uh, this is a network that is much sparser. It actually has only half of the possible connections. Um, but it has this small world property in which strangers are indirectly connected uh, even when, they're, when they never interact. So for example here, participants G and H, uh, they never speak to each other, but they're connected, for example, via participant F or participant D. So innovations can still spread to the network. And we compared uh, this to the scale-free network, which is argued to be the most representative ne uh, network of modern human populations. Um, and it has the same number of connections as the small world, so it's just as sparse. Um, <coughs> but it follows a power law in the sense that um, there are a few agents that are highly connected. Here, it's participant A, he's our hub, he's connected to almost everyone in the group. Uh, but most agents are actually not so well connected. So participant E, F, T, for example, they all have only three other connections. And what we're doing is we're looking at the differences between the languages created by these networks uh, over time. The experiment takes about four hours to complete. And we're comparing them on four measures to characterize the language on a group level. So the first measure we look at is linguistic structure, and that is how um, systematic is the language that these participants end up developing. We're looking at convergence, that is how, uh, how much do participants end up sharing a lexicon, so how much do they align and converge on one uh, set of meanings. We're looking at stability, that is how does the language change from time, from over time. Uh, and we're looking at communicative success, whether uh, participants are actually uh, able to interact successfully with each other and understand each other. And together, these four measures can really describe the life formation of grammar as a result of these communicative needs. But I'm not going to go through uh, all of them because there's no time. So I'm just going to focus on linguistic structure because I think it's the most compelling and relevant one. But I also have the data for everything else in case you're interested. Um, okay, 
So basically what we're asking in this measure is the following question. We're asking whether similar scenes or similar meanings are expressed in a systematic way using consistent similar words. Uh, basically this is, um, we're testing the correlation between word similarity and meaning similarity. So for every pair of labels in the language, what we're doing is we're calculating the Levenstein distances between the words. That basically just says how much do labels differ from each other in, in terms of their letters. Um, and we correlate that with the difference in the meanings. So how do the scenes of these two different labels, how much do they differ from each other? Do they have different shapes? Do they have different uh, motions? And this gives us an objective uh, score that represents basically how systematic and regular the language is. I'm happy to explain more about this measure if you actually want to know how it's uh, calculated. But the basic idea is that if a language has a high structure score, oh, sorry. Uh, if a language has a high structure score, it means that um, there is a compositional, sorry. Yeah. There is a compositional and clear way to name, uh, to name the scenes. So that means that the same shape or the same angle is consistently represented using the same part part words. Uh, but if a language has a low structure score, what this means is that there is actually no clear way, no pattern in naming the scenes, so words can be quite different. Um, yeah, so this relates to the idea of simplicity in the sense that if you have more structure, that means the language is more transparent, more regular, more systematic, and presumably simpler to use and learn. Okay, so let's focus first on the first feature, that's community size. Um, what I'm plotting here is time on the x-axis, that is uh, the round number, and on the y-axis, uh, the mean structure score. So remember, higher structure is better, simpler, um, and the groups uh, in this color coding. And this is how it looks like. Oh, it's very slow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So of course, we don't just look at the data. We use mixed effect models to see what happens. And basically, what we see is that the model shows that languages are becoming significantly more structured over time. So some participants develop really compositional languages, which I'll show you in a second. But the most important thing is that the big groups show a faster increase in structure. So that by the end of the experiment, their languages are more systematic and more regular. And this is presumably because the pressure to create the systematic languages is higher in the larger groups. So participants in a big group have less shared history with each other, and there is more variability around them. Uh, they have more variants and more people they need to agree with. And while in a small group, maybe you can just remember the unique variations of everyone without really converging. Uh, in a big group, that's really hard to do. There is a lot of variability. So convergence is much harder, but it's also much more needed, because otherwise you're never, never going to be able to successfully interact with the other person. Um, so the idea is that because of this difficulty, participants end up under pressure to develop something more generalizable. And to support this idea, in the paper we found that, first of all, big groups really show more input variability. So it really is the case that the big groups are more variable and more diverse. And more input variability induces a greater increase in structure for in the next time point. And very interestingly, by the end of the experiment, even though the members of the big groups had it harder to converge, they actually end up in the same level of convergence as the small groups. And I would like to show you some examples of these languages. I'm gonna a bit rush through them because of time. What I'm doing here is I'm plotting the language of one participant in one big group uh, at the end of the experiment. Um, and here the gray axis indicate uh, the direction to which the scene was going to on the screen. So what happens here is that the participant cons consistently named shaped one as MOP. That means that no matter where the scene went to on the screen, it was always called MOP. Um, shape two, for example, was called FEM. That means that no matter where it went to on the screen, it was always called FEM. And maybe you notice that also the labels have a second part, and that's basically the morpheme participants developed for direction. So here what they did is they categorized the um, continuous meaning space into orthogonal axis, up, down, and left, right, with a morpheme to indicate up and down and left and right that they can be combined. So for example, I want to talk about shape one that's moving in an upright direction. I would use the morpheme for shape one, the morpheme for up, and the morpheme for right, creating uh, a nice compositional and very easy uh, language, and this was true for all the other shapes. And just in contrast, I want to give you an example of a small group, just so you understand what I mean when the languages are a bit less systematic. So this is the language of a small group. It also has very systematic uh, labels for the shapes. But uh, in this case, the, the motion uh, morphology is a bit harder. So you have a morphing for down and a morphing for up, but they're pretty similar. So mipo and ipo, 
confusable. And the morphemes for left and right are the same morpheme, but their direction is different. So C tuck versus tuck C. And if you want to say that something is going in an upright, uh, sadly, you cannot combine the morpheme for up and the morpheme for right. It's a, just a different morpheme. So this is regular and systematic nonetheless. It's a grammar, but it's a bit harder. Um, OK. Uh, we also find that the big groups showed more, small groups showed more variance. So maybe you can see they're kind of all over the place, uh, while the big groups all behave in the same way. And um, yeah, so we think this is also because of the pressure to develop a systematic language. All groups, big groups, were under this pressure. But in the small groups, um, some of them could get away with other strategies, like, for example, never developing a, a lexicon uh, together. And these findings suggest that maybe small communities are under a, a, um, more uh, vulnerability to drift. Um, but it's a speculation. OK. Quickly show you what happens um, when, what about uh, changing the network structure and density. So it's actually the exact same plot, color codes uh, at the bottom, and this is what we find. Ooh. Very slow. I'm just going to click through it. Yay. OK, so all languages become more systematic over time. But importantly, all the networks develop equally structured languages. So they show the same degree of high structure throughout the experiment with no differences between the structure created by the three different networks. Um, and this is confirmed also using a base factor analysis just to be sure that it's not just a, a null result. The null is really favored very strongly. Uh, so there seems to really be no effect in network structure, at least in this experiment. Um, and actually, overall, we think this result makes sense because when we look at the degree of input variability across the networks, we actually see that they don't differ. So all the networks have the same level of variability, which we postulated was the mechanism in the first experiment. And here, all the networks are the same. It could be because there's two opposing forces here um, that maybe cancel each other out in the long run. So it's possible that in a sparser network, it's easier. To, it's um, you can maintain more diversity on the group level because you have more potential strangers, but for every individual in the network, they actually interact with less people. So maybe for, for you as an individual, you actually experience less variability, uh, although the group is bigger. So we don't know. Um, I will summarize uh, and say that what we can say out of this is that linguistic structure seems to be sensitive to community size, independent of network structure, but it does not seem to differ with um, uh, the type of networks, at least not when the size is this small, so eight people, and um, yeah. And actually, we suspect that if we would have a larger group, so for example, 20 people or more, uh, or maybe a stronger manipulation on sparsity, um, that could lead to input variability differences and maybe then to a different result, um, but not in this case. And I think uh, the main point I want you to kind of take home from this is that these findings does have important, do have important implications for language diversity. They suggest that, um, and experimentally, that uh, the social environment can really affect the evolution uh, of languages and the way, um, the patterns that we see in languages around the world. So I just want to thank everyone who helped me uh, think, program, operationalize this experiment, and thank you. <laughs>